10 myths about multiple sclerosis. Number one, people with MS will eventually require a wheelchair. In reality, the prognosis of MS is highly variable with a lot of people doing surprisingly well after many decades. For example, this study at the University of California, San Francisco called the MS Epic Study found that for people with relapsing onset MS, even after 20 years, only about 16% even required a cane to walk 100 meters. The remainder were walking independently without assistance. However, the prognosis of progressive MS tends to be somewhat worse. According to this other study, by age 60, about 25% did require a wheelchair, although many people with progressive MS do surprisingly well also. There's also a trend for the prognosis of MS in terms of disability to be getting better over time Time, possibly because we're better at diagnosing milder MS and due to the effect of disease modifying therapies. Number two, stem cells can treat multiple sclerosis. This is a tricky one. There is a treatment, hematopoietic stem cell transplant, which has been used to treat multiple sclerosis successfully for over 40 years. However, it's not exactly a stem cell treatment. The way it works is that chemotherapy is given to wipe out the immune system, and your own hematopoietic stem cells are used to regenerate the immune system to reduce the risk of side effects from the treatment. But it's really the conditioning regimen, the chemotherapy that drives the therapeutic effects, and stronger conditioning regimens such as BEAM are clearly more effective than weaker conditioning regimens. So it might be better characterized as an immune destruction therapy or immune rebooting therapy than a stem cell therapy. However, there is preliminary research on using mesenchymal stem cells to regenerate the immune system, excuse me, the nervous system, in the absence of chemotherapy. And there is some impressive preliminary data, though in my opinion it's still heretofore unproven. Number three, MS is genetic. This is true to some extent. For example, certain genes are clearly associated with MS. For example, the allele HLA-DRB11501, if you have two copies of this, you have an eightfold increased risk. However, the risk is not that high in relatives. Even an identical twin of someone with MS has around a 25% risk. And for other more distant relatives, the relationship is not that strong. For instance, the niece or nephew of someone with MS has around a 1% risk. And the reason is there are significant significant environmental factors, Epstein-Barr virus exposure, sunlight exposure, vitamin D levels. As you can see from this map, the rate of MS varies widely throughout the globe, suggesting that there are things other than genetics that are contributing to the disease. Number four, multiple sclerosis is a Caucasian or white person disease. That's interesting because most of my patients are not white. I work in Los Angeles of the United States, by the way. We did a formal study in Southern California Permanente Medical Group, and we found that African Americans and white people have roughly equal risk of MS. Hispanic individuals do have a slightly lower risk, and Asian people have a dramatically lower risk. Other studies have found that Native Americans and First Canadians also have a lower risk, but really anyone in any ethnicity can get multiple sclerosis. Number five, MS is associated with other autoimmune diseases. Ooh, I'll bet a lot of neurologists believe this one, but is it true? Well, it is true that autoimmune diseases are generally speaking associated with each other. For example, let's take a look at this study on vitiligo and autoimmune diseases that causes loss of pigmentation of the skin. It's very clearly associated with other autoimmune diseases. But let's take a look at the study of women with MS. Here, an odds ratio of one would suggest equal risk to the general population. To me, it looks like it's all over the place with no clear association. You think I'm cherry picking here? Let's look at another study. Again, the data are all over the place with no clear association. Now, there are some studies showing an association, but to me, my overall review of the data suggests it's very unclear. There may be some unique mechanisms of the pathogenesis of MS. For example, the HLA variants associated with MS are not associated with other autoimmune diseases, and there may be some local factors like regulation of the blood-brain barrier. Also, certain medications that treat other autoimmune diseases, like TNF-alpha blocking agents, actually worsen and MS. So MS seems to be a somewhat unique disease that's not strongly associated with other autoimmune diseases. Number six, people with MS are immunosuppressed. Well, many medications used to treat MS are in fact immunosuppressants and do increase the risk of infections. Also, some people with advanced multiple sclerosis with a lot of disability, for instance, with swallowing difficulty, could be at increased risk of certain infections such as aspiration pneumonia. But MS itself is a disease of immune system 
regulation, it's not a deficiency of the immune system. And generally speaking, people with MS alone without other risk factors aren't at increased risk of infections. For instance, there's good evidence that for people with MS who are not taking immunosuppressants, for instance, they're not taking disease-modifying therapy or taking disease-modifying therapy not associated with immunosuppression, such as beta interferons or glutarium or acetate, they were not at increased risk of severe COVID-19 adjusting for their age and other comorbidities. So MS itself is not an immunosuppressed state. Number seven, MS goes into remission during pregnancy. Now this is kind of true. The risk of relapses is definitely less during pregnancy, particularly during the third trimester, as you can see in this graph, it does increase temporarily after delivery. This is thought to be due to regulation of the immune system during pregnancy to make it more of an immunotolerized state due to the presence of the fetus, which is antigenically different from you, so you don't attack your own fetus. However, the symptoms of MS don't necessarily go away. Some women do feel better, but some women could feel worse in terms of fatigue, which can be caused by both pregnancy and MS, so it just varies a lot from person to person. Also, there's really no evidence that pregnancy changes the overall prognosis of MS in the long run. There is a tendency for less disabled women to be more likely to choose to have children, but this is more reverse causation. Number eight, heat worsens MS. Again, this is kind of true. It's very well known that increases in body temperature due to exercise, fever, or increase in ambient temperature can worsen the symptoms of MS. This is known as Utah's phenomenon, and it's thought to be due to the fact that heat can cause a decreased conduction of information through demyelinated nerve fibers. And many people, when exposed to the heat, can feel really lousy and have worsening of their existing symptoms or even symptoms they had years ago. However, there's no evidence that heat worsens the underlying disease or causes new lesions. It just causes a temporary worsening of symptoms. In fact, MS is more common in colder areas further from the equator. So doctors used to tell patients don't go into a hot tub or don't exercise, but this is silly. You can do whatever you want. It's just that some people with MS are very sensitive to the heat. And obviously if it causes unpleasant symptoms, you may want to avoid or minimize that behavior. Number nine, MS starts between age 20 and 40. Now it is true that the average age of onset of MS is approximately age 30, but as you can see from these studies, the range is quite wide. Now it's rare for people to have an onset of MS before puberty or after age 80, but anything else is not so uncommon. I've had patients be told they can't have MS because they're only 15 or because they're too old, they're 55, but that's just absurd. It's very common for teenagers or people in their 50s, 60s, and 70s to get an onset of multiple sclerosis. Number 10, steroids prevent disability in people with multiple sclerosis. Now this hasn't been looked at in a very long time, so we're looking at an older study here, but consider the optic neuritis treatment trial published in 1999. You can see that people who received intravenous methylprednisolone, a high-dose steroid, did recover faster from optic neuritis than people getting placebo, but after six months, their visual acuity was approximately the same. Now I am cherry picking a little bit here. There are other metrics that did seem to favor steroids, but the difference was not that significant. So I think we should think of steroids as a way to speed recovery, not to change the long-term prognosis. To prevent long-term disability in MS, I think we need to focus on lifestyle and disease-modifying therapies. So I hope you enjoyed the video, and I'll include some references in the notes below. If you know any other myths about MS, please comment below, or if you have any challenges to my so-called myths, I admit a few are somewhat controversial, and let me know if you have suggestions for other videos.